But tonight, what I want to do is I actually want to talk to you about something that I consider to be really the greatest disease that a Christian can have. You are so powerful. You have so many things going inside of your life that you don't even know how powerful you are. Now, because most individuals haven't really spent their time at being able to use their words for good, but are very, very proficient in being able to use their words that would hurt or, or injure other individuals, that word that they speak comes to pass pretty quickly, doesn't it? When we say something negative, all of a sudden it, it happens inside of an individual's life. So what I want to do is I want to tell you this very interesting thing. When writing about the most destructive human behaviors, the life science individuals actually gave these as an example. They gave the example of lying and cheating. These are the most uh, destructive of human examples and, and difficult behaviors. So lying and cheating and stealing and a person that holds on or clings to their bad habits, bullying, is, was a really big one on the list, and stress, and gambling. But the worst of all behaviors of a human being, more than anything else, actually what these people and these doctors had written about was gossip. Is the most destructive of all of the different behaviors that an individual can have, is gossip. Now, how about the use of gossip? You see, the use of gossip is interesting. We humans are evolutionarily set up to judge and talk about others, no matter how hurtful that it might be, researchers actually say. That we actually are evolutionarily set up to speak about other people. That's how we do it. We speak about it. And there's reasons for all of that, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But an Oxford primatologist, Robin Dunbar, said this. She said that baboons groom each other to keep social ties strong. They actually get close to one another. They actually groom each other. They spend the time with one another to be able to keep their, their ties very strong. But we humans are more evolved. So what we do is that we use gossip as social glue. And both are learned behaviors. Grooming another is a learned behavior. Gossiping is a learned behavior. You see, gossip establishes group boundaries and it boosts self-esteem. What happens when people gossip is, is that it actually draws an individual closer, and we'll get into that in just a moment. What it does is that it will actually open up a door to a group of people that you have wanted to be with for some time that seemingly had doors closed to you, that you weren't really part of it. But all of a sudden, if what you would do is that you would partake of gossip, then the doors would be open for you. If you became just like them, if you spoke negatively, if you actually became critical, if you became a person that judged and condemned someone else, someone that they were interested in doing so to, then you would actually be accepted into the group. And you don't really realize that evolutionarily, which is an interesting word, isn't it? evolutionarily, you and I really want connectivity. And because we want that connectivity, we almost will do things or say things that we really shouldn't in order to come to that place where we will feel accepted and wanted inside of a group. So gossip establishes group boundaries and it boosts self-esteem. People who gossip actually take a place of personal superiority over other individuals. And when they take that place of superiority over other individuals, they actually get into what the Bible calls Gnosticism. Gnosticism just means this, is that I know something that you don't know. The Gnostics, the mystics, the things that were mysterious that these individuals had, that they had understanding about the things of life that other people did not have about the things of life. So gossip establishes group boundaries. You're part of our group, we talk about this. You're not part of our group, and we, we're just going to put you outside, and we're going to make you feel horrible that you wouldn't partake of the same things that we were, we were actually saying. 
Now, the goal of gossip is not truth or accuracy. It is the bond that gossiping can forge, often at the expense of the one or those around them that is being talked about. It's that bond that people form by gossip is the reason why people get into it. And they'll say things, well, I'm just saying. Well, I just needed to tell you the truth. I think that you needed to know this. And oh, no, I'm not saying anything negative. What it is is that, you know, if you think that that's really negative, then really what's wrong with you? There must be something wrong with you. If you don't see this as positive, then you can't be part of our group. And so when two people share a dislike of another person, it or gossip is what brings them closer. The most effective way of solidifying thought towards a group, a set of people, or an individual is to create them as a common enemy. Now, there is a book that's out there, and I'm going to tell you what it is, and I will never bring this book up again, but if you want to know how that groups do what they do in order to be able to, um, let's just say, influence society in a negative way, it's called the true believer. Now, it's not speaking about believing in Christ. What it is, is it, it actually uses people as, as a group to be able to bring down anything or any type of situation you want to bring down. And they use this of coming together in order to be able to destroy someone else that they want to destroy. And they won't stop until they do. So let me go over that again. The most effective way of solidifying thought towards a group a set of people or an individual is to create them as your enemy. They're our common enemy. They're, they're your, my enemy, and you know, my enemy must be your enemy because you're in our group. So we have this common enemy. We create them as a common enemy. Propagandists, militants, ethnic groups, terrorists have all employed this method. And if you go through this and understand it, You'll figure it out. But the one that is most destructive of all is gossip about other people, other human beings, other individuals that God himself has created. That's the most destructive of all gossips, to repeat a matter unnecessarily. You know, there may be some things that are true, but that doesn't mean there may be some things about you that are true, but that doesn't mean I need to repeat them. I wouldn't want anybody to be able to, you know, actually get closer to me over the fact that what they're doing is that they're actually, they're actually at a place where what they do is that they use you as their whipping post in order to be able to show their loyalty toward me. Do you understand that? And so you see, I can see how quiet that you are. Because this is a big one inside of the lives of people. And what they don't really realize is how hurtful that this is to a person's own spiritual life. What ends up happening is that no matter how good of things that you can make or you can do inside of your life, the moment that you get over into gossip, you don't really realize what you're doing to yourself. Do you know you can rise up until your own point of failure? You can't continue to go on. Because what happens is, is that gossip will hold you back. You see, rumor or talk of a personal, sensational, or intimate nature, a person who habitually spreads intimate, private rumors or facts, gossip may be true, Gossip may be true, but a rumor is fabricated or it's guessed. People guess, and that becomes a rumor, but it fits into the gossip category. Gossip is the truth about someone's life, which should never be repeated. Because the closer that you get to individuals, especially in God's, in God's economy, the closer you get to an individual, there are things that you should cover. You need to cover your brother while you expose the devil instead of covering the devil and exposing your brother. Isn't that true? But there are people that are crippled 
in their faith life right now all over the issue of gossip. Do you know, I can always tell, and I mentioned this to someone today uh, as we were talking, and I was kind of deciding what I was going to talk to you about tonight. I said, but I can always tell how a set of parents feel about me by talking to their kids without their children saying one word. I know exactly what their parents talk about at home. Isn't that true? It really is true. The children don't have to say anything, but you can tell whether they're sheepish, whether they want to talk to you, how their parents esteem you, how it is that you're felt about inside of their home the moment that you look at that child and they can't even look you in the face. Because what it is is that their parents have already used that tool of gossip to be able to distance that child from someone else. And you don't really realize that that child, the moment that you do so, may never in their entire lifetime recover from what you have said. So gossip is a really, really interesting thing because gossip is true and rumor is fabricated or it's guessed. Gossip is the truth about someone's life which should never be repeated. And a rumor is information that you start spreading without verification or without truth. You see, when we become Christians... We give up the biggies. Isn't that true? We give up the biggies. We give up lying, stealing, drinking, cheating, drugs, sleeping around. We give up all of those kind of things. And what we've done now is we've created a set of borders inside of our Christianity. We begin to spend time with our new friends talking about the Lord and what's going on around us. Harmless in the beginning. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles, if you would. I want you to see this. In Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is actually giving us the entire truth of the kingdom of God. He is telling us all about how the kingdom of God actually works. And what he's doing is, as he's talking about this, he's talking to them about things that become more and more difficult in understanding all the time. Do you know when you first come into, into the body of Christ, people are talking to you. And it's really, it's great. Do you know, when, when you first become a Christian, no one really pollutes your faith. You're just so happy about Jesus. And you know, when you first come to the Lord inside your life, you are so in tuned with the Holy Spirit, you get prayers answered without ever praying. Things are happening inside of your life that you never expected. God becomes so real to you in everything. It's just an amazing time. You want to do it over again and over again and over again all the time. So over time, what happens in individuals' lives is exactly what we're talking about tonight. Because over time, what ends up happening is that people quit bringing out the Bible when they get together. They quit talking about the Word. They quit spending time worshiping God Casting out devils, praying for their friends. They stop thinking that what we do is when we get together is that, man, we go, after, we go after the devil. We pray in the spirit for a couple hours, man, and then we have something to eat. We just worship God a little bit more, and then we go home. That was a party that we used to have. Then all of a sudden, what it ended up happening was over the years, what happens is you have to fix one offense with an individual after another. I actually was... I went inside the office today after church this morning and, um, and there was a woman who was sitting there and she was waiting to be able to speak to someone and I was just walking through on my way back to the office after the service. And she stopped me and she said, Pastor, she said, can I ask you a question? With everything I am, my personality says, well, you already have, <laughs> you know. I mean, so I said, yeah, sure, please, whatever. And she said, my name is so-and-so, and because I did not know who she was. You know, there have been many, many people that have been around for so long that have just been so faithful, and you just don't know who they are. They never really push their way to the front of the class. They're just there, part of the, you know, part of the barge moving down the uh, canal of life. And so she said to me, she said, you know, my husband... Today, he's over at church somewhere just listening to my 
nephew speak. And you know, he hasn't been in church in 10 years. The last time he went to church was here. And I said, well, please tell me. I said, what happened? She said, he got offended. I said, well, was it something I said? She said, oh, no. She said, you didn't do it. You didn't have anything to do with it. Not a thing. And I said, would you please let me have his phone number? I want to text him and call him. Can you imagine someone who allowed their life to be completely altered for eternity over something that someone else said and they never talked about it? And so, my communication is out. We'll get to talk today, tomorrow, and we're going to restore him. But in Mark chapter 4, it's an interesting thing because when you first come to Christ, when you're there, you are so on fire for God, people would never come to you with anything. They would never talk to you. They don't talk, talk to an individual, excuse me. They don't talk to an individual who actually is on fire. They don't do that. They only talk to someone who can be persuaded. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's, that's really true. So Jesus was dealing with this very issue. In Mark chapter 4, um, verse number 15, take a look and see. It says, and these are, they, uh, are the ones that, by the wayside where the word is sown. That when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He said, and these are they, uh, likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. But then, when affliction, and they have no root in themselves, and so they endure, but for a time, afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Everyone say this, arises, arises. For, the for the word's sake. Now that is the issue right there. You always have to keep in mind, don't ever believe for a moment, never believe for a moment that hell cares one ounce about you. It doesn't. It never did. All it cares about is to be able to take away from you everything that was ever deposited in you. Because you don't realize how powerful you are. How powerful your words are. How powerful your presence is. How powerful of the things that you can create inside of your lifetime. And it does everything it can do to get you to a place to where you will never ever discover it by actually putting out all of these flares and challenges and issues and dysfunctions and everything else inside of your life so that you won't see that really what happened to you was was that God's word was being taken away from you and that which used to be on fire, that had a flame that was so hot, all of a sudden, it's smoke. It's not a flame anymore. And that's where Jesus said, he said this, a smoking flax he'll not put out. He's not going to do it. He's not going to actually put you away. What he's going to do is he's going to work with you. He's going to continue to come at you with the word of God. He's going to continue actually really working with you until your fire will be a flame all over again. And so here it says afterward when, uh, when tribulation or affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake. Remember in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then Affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. It never arose for your sake. Never. You see, the devil doesn't care if you go to heaven. The devil only cares 
if you bring heaven to earth. He doesn't care about you going to heaven. He doesn't care. So by the time that people get into, oh, 45, 46, 47 years old, they've already been at a place where what they've done is they've pretty much given it up. They've given up the Word of God. They've given up really pressing, really going in for more. And that's what happens to individuals. And now, sadly, I can look back and I can tell you the things I've seen. Remember this. Never talk to a person who only has a theory about something. Only talk to someone who has seen something in life. Notice what's next, verse 18. It says, now these are they which are sown among thorns. These irritations. He said that they're the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this present life, the cares of this world, this world, stuff right around here. The cares of this world, not the next world, the cares of this world. The stuff between people. He said, the deceitfulness of riches. Well, I got to start making some money. I've really got to go out there. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to do things that have to do with God's ministry anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go out there and do what I can do in order for me to be able to make all of the kind of money that I need to make. I'm just going to go out there. Now, that's true, and it needs to be true for many individuals. But it doesn't need to be true for some individuals. And so what they do is that they give up the focus on God's will and God's purpose and God's direction. And what they do, and this happens after an individual has gotten everything that they personally as a family need. When their kids no longer are in children's church, they quit working in children's church. When all of a sudden their kids start growing up, what happens is all of a sudden they no longer really keep the commitments that they've had all of these years. And they start out with great commitment, but they don't end with great commitment. And so here, he said, the deceitful niche of riches and the desires for other things entering in do what? Okay, and, uh, and what becomes unfruitful? God's word becomes unfruitful. So these things come into people's lives. When you first become a Christian, you are so, so turned on to the things of God that no one will ever say anything to you. But what happens is, is that the moment that you begin to stop having this as your defense, you, if you want to talk to me, all you need to do is just tell me what God said. We need no argument. We need no disagreement. We don't have to talk about much at all. As a matter of fact, we can kiss each other and we can go out and have dinner. It's just fine because our conversation only needs to be 10 minutes long. Because if this is what he said, this is what he said, and if this is what he said, then both of us can rejoice that our Father has spoken to us. Yes. Instead of somebody saying, well, you know, I used to believe that, but I don't believe that anymore. See, there's nothing you can do. And what happens with people over time is that God's Word no longer really continues to be the most important thing to them. And what ends, up, what ends up taking its place is that God and His Word aren't the thing that's central focus. What's the central focus is other people. The ones that no longer serve my purpose. The ones that I'm trying to get rid of. The ones that I don't want around me. All those individuals give birth to strife inside my life. So what ends up happening is, is that I begin to gossip. Now, the moment that an individual begins to gossip, you can rest assured of this one thing. God's Word is no longer a part of their life. I can see how excited that you are. So many times our conversations are filled with other things after we become a Christian for some time. They begin to be filled with judgment of others, with rumors, things we really can't prove, but we begin to say things like, did you hear about? Hey, I'll tell you what, what about this? And instead, what we do is we begin to rehearse things 
that are negative about other individuals rather than actually going to their aid and running to, uh, for them and to give them our emotional support. We begin to justify our feelings through the pain of another person. And that's the very thing that destroys God's kingdom rather than brings it together. These rumors are hearsay and shameful truths. You see, and we do this all behind a Christian smile. Never get yourself into that. You see, the Bible talks a lot about gossip because it's not a little sin. In Levit Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16, it says, Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not try to get ahead at the cost of your neighbor's life. He said, For I am the Lord. Psalm 101, verse number 5 in the New American Standard Bible says this, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him will I destroy. I thought, goodness gracious, that doesn't sound like dad. But just remember, he's also the dad of the other person that you're talking about. And if one of the kids needs a spanking, it's not because you don't love them, it's because they need a spanking. And so he said, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor is going to get a spanking. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. You see, people that gossip are revealing two things. They reveal two things. Number one is their desire to bring pain into the lives of others, to hurt others, because in many times they themselves have been hurt by someone, whether rightfully or wrongfully they've been hurt. Number two, their desire to be involved in sin themselves. In the book of Romans chapter 2 verse number 1 it says, you therefore without excuse O man in that you judge another. For in your judging another you condemn yourself. For you also have done the very same things. You've done it. You see a person that can recognize what's wrong with other individuals is an individual that is so close to all of that he can tell you what it is. Instead of thinking well you know this you know, this guy must be having a lot of trouble in his life. You know, I'll tell you, let's just pray for him right now. Instead, what we're able to do when we're having those same things and going through those same challenges ourselves, we can easily not only detect but also describe what's going on in the life of another because it's already going on in ours. That's why we can tell it. Do you understand that? Okay, that's really true. And so they get involved in those two things, their desire to bring pain, their desire to hurt someone else, or their desire to be involved in it themselves. You see, what they don't realize is that they're setting a date for their own dismantling. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 11, the Bible says the younger widows should not be on the list because their physical desires will overpower their devotion to Christ and they'll want to remarry then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. He said, besides, they are likely, these individuals that you begin to exercise your grace and your mercy inside of their lives before God wants it to be done, he said that they are likely to become lazy, lazy and spend their time gossiping from house to house, getting, to, uh, getting into other people's business and saying things that they shouldn't. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Paul was very, very open about people that, that actually don't do the things that they themselves are supposed to do in God's house. What they end up doing, he said, this is going to happen. They stop in their previous commitments and then they begin to gossip about others saying things that they shouldn't. Saying things that they should not. You see, look where God places gossip. In Romans chapter 1, verse number 28, it says that when they refused to acknowledge God, they abandoned or he abandoned them to their evil minds and let them do the things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, fighting, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. He said these people that gossip, they're backstabbers. Now, if I would have written the Bible, I could understand how it would bother you. But there's only so long that what you can do 
is that you can avoid talking about things that you have to talk about. I choose to talk about these things on Sunday night because of the size of our group, because then at least I will have been faithful to have spoken about them. So someone can't say that I've never spoken about the subject because now I have. And so here it says that they're backstabbers, haters of God. Even though they'll tell you that they love God, they're hating him because they're working against everything that he himself stands for. He said they're, they're insolent and proud and boastful. They're forever inventing new ways of sinning and are disobedient to their parents. My goodness gracious. How in the world could they say that they're disobedient to their parents. That's interesting. You think it through. Notice there it says that they refuse to understand. They refuse to understand. They break their promises and are heartless and they're unforgiving. It's interesting to me that in Christianity, I can find more forgiveness of something in life with people that have actually never, would never darken the doors of a church than I can going inside of a church and seeing if two people can ever truly forgive one another. Truly forgive them. I just choose never to get in a place to where I need to forgive somebody. Or I get into this bitterness myself or unforgiveness that I then have to go and deal with it. Notice where, it's, where he goes with it. He said, they're fully aware of God's death penalty for those who do these things. Yet they go right ahead and do them anyway. And worse yet, they encourage others to do them just as well. Wow. If I would have written that, I would have been a brain. But I didn't. You see, something doesn't have to be a lie to make it gossip. Doesn't have to be a lie. Telling the truth for the wrong motive can be more destructive than telling a lie. So here's a layman's definition of gossip. It's revealing anything about someone when sharing it is not part of the solution to their problems. Gossip is sharing anything about someone when sharing it is not a part of the solution to their problem. The question is, well, I never said anything, but are you listening? I'll never forget the time that a friend actually came to me and they told me about one of their staff members who came to them and said, you know, doctor, I, I, I want to talk to you about this because I'll tell you what, I was with, you know, we'll just call him Jimmy last night. I was with Jimmy last night. I'm telling you what, for two and a half hours, Jimmy went on about you and said things, and Jimmy just said all of this stuff. I'm telling you, Jimmy just did said all these things, and I just wanted to let you know. And he responded with this. He said, you know, he said, I could almost believe that Jimmy said what he said. The thing that I can't believe is that you would sit there for two and a half hours and listen to Jimmy. <laughs> it's not the fact that Jimmy said it. Jimmy could have never said it if you wouldn't have listened. You see, many believe that listening to gossip is not as bad as spreading it, but that's not so. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number 4, the Bible says this, wrongdoers listen to wicked talk. Wrongdoers listen to wicked talk. Liars pay attention to destructive words. Liars pay attention to to destructive words. Liars pay attention to destructive words. Um, let me say that again in case you missed it. Liars are what pay attention, are who that pay attention to words that should never be spoken. Father said that. I didn't say that. I'm just your brother. David said to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24. How many of you love David in this story? Isn't David a great guy? In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse number 9, the Bible says this, that he said, that he shouted to Saul, why do you listen to the people who say that I'm trying to harm you? Why are you listening to them? Why have you never spoken to me? I had a pin. 
in the Message Bible, it says this. He called out, why do you listen to those who say David is out to get you? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, he said, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other people's matters. You see, we must firmly say, I'm sorry, but you're telling me something that I really, really, I shouldn't be listening to because you don't really realize that when people speak to you, it goes into you and it steals God's words. You see, you need to take this to the Lord and to those who are involved. Did you speak to them yet? Face to face, exactly in what you're speaking to me. Because there is no doubt that they never did. Never did. Never did. In Proverbs chapter 7, in, in people, you have to realize, people kind of get, like they get kind of, um, how many of you ever played baseball? You'll understand this if you played baseball at all. So you'll understand. When a guy begins to run the bases, over time you begin to learn to run them better, don't you? you begin to actually really realize that you can use from one base to the next base to be able to push off of in order for you to gain the speed that you need in order to go to the next base. So you begin to just touch the inside of that base all the time. You're not really touching it, going over it. What you're doing is that you're touching the edges of all of it. And what happens is, is that people learn those very same things. They learn how to touch something or how to graze something without really doing it but they graze it because they want to do as little as they possibly can without going on to full engagement about a situation so here in proverbs 6 19 it says a false witness who speaks lies or rumors and one who sows discord or gossip among brethren god said that he hates that Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates the best of friends. Proverbs 16, 28, it says, A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Proverbs 26, 20, it says, Fire goes out for lack of fuel, and quarrels will disappear when gossip stops. Oh. Proverbs 25, 9. It says, so discuss the matter with them privately. If you've got something you need to discuss, discuss it. Don't just let bad words actually cook inside you. They'll destroy you. Talk with them privately. Don't tell anyone else. Or others will may accuse you of gossip. Then you'll never regain your reputation. You'll never regain it because it's gone. So how do you know then, friends? How do you know when chit-chat actually becomes gossip? How can you tell the difference when that happens? Here's how you can tell the difference. How you can tell the difference when light conversation and idle chit-chat elevates to negative, inflammatory, and embarrassing statements to the person being spoken of. You'll know at that moment that you've ventured into gossip because this becomes a form of personal attack. If you're still not sure, think of these illustrations. Ask yourself these questions. Does the chit-chat rejoice in the misfortune of others? If it does, then it's gossip. Do the words that are being spoken have a negative emotional charge to them? Do they, because every word has a charge, doesn't it? Do they have a negative emotional charge or seem to perpetuate conflict or negativity? It becomes gossip again. Does it hurt or damage the one being spoken of? 
Would you say it in front of the person's face? Is it an unsubstantiated rumor or something that was taken out of context? I mean, we could take Jesus out of context. Where the Bible actually says, and Judas hanged himself. Go thou and do likewise. All you need to do is you could take Jesus out of context all the time and say everything that you wanted to be able to say about Jesus when you take something out of context. So let me finish with, with this. I wanted to make sure that I got this out so that you were able to look at it, study it, and think about it if you felt that it was necessary. So here are some steps to getting rid of gossip. Number one, enact a zero tolerance policy on gossip. Zero tolerance. Zero. Ne nada. Never. Don't even approach it. You know, Kevin, my friend who uh, we've been friends now for how long, Dal? 48 years. Kevin and I have been friends for 48 years. And so um, he said to me, he said, you know, Rob, he said, I never hear what you're, what you're telling me right now. I said, and you never will. Because people are not going to talk to you about it because you can't be persuaded. Remember this. No gossiper wants to expend any energy on a person that cannot be persuaded. Never. They just won't. So the first thing is, have a zero tolerance policy on gossip. Number two, set an example. Be a good role model for others to follow and don't engage in the gossip. Just don't go there with people. Be assertive. Walk away or change the subject when the gossip begins. Be that smart. Be an example. You see, the message that you're communicating to others is that that behavior is not accepted or appreciated by you. Number three, let the person know. Let them know exactly what you did. Let them know exactly what was said. Don't make them live suspicion, in, in suspicion. What you don't really realize is this. Every one of you is very perceptive. You have the Holy Spirit inside your life. You're very perceptive. And what happens is, is that when you go into the room with other people, you know exactly what they're thinking. They don't need to include you in on a conversation. You can feel what they just said. You know what they're listening to. And you know who the one, isn't it funny? You know who the one in the room is that was doing the talking. Because that's how perceptive that you are. So you have to understand this. That, um, And let me give you a story. A story about a girl who was actually telling about her job. That what it was was that she just never felt appreciated in her job or in her workplace. She didn't feel appreciated. She didn't think that her boss was ever encouraging. She didn't think that he appreciated her in, in anything. But you must realize that it is the circumstances uh, that begin to be created by the way that you feel about something. You begin to draw it out of other individuals. And so an experiment was done with her. And what she did was she began to tell herself that actually that her boss began to appreciate her. Her boss began to tell, you know, her how wonderful that she was and how good of work that she did and how well that she performed and how that she could actually take on more responsibility and then get to a place to where she got a raise. And it was not, it was, it was almost immediate in the way that it happened, but it happened exactly the way that she was drawing it to herself. And that's what happens with individuals. When you go inside of a room, people know how you feel. You say, yeah, but I never said anything. But you don't have to say anything. You need to understand. 
Here, Greg, stand up. Come here. You midget. Come here. <laughs> I don't know what Jesus. Yeah, don't touch me. You, I don't want you breaking me. I'm only little. <laughs> Ow. Aren't you, don't you feel bad? <laughs> Why God did that to you? But, but here's the thing. Whatever you put right here, it comes out. You can't stop it. It's inside there. Now, it's almost kind of like an individual who eats garlic. Right. Linda loves garlic. I just don't let her have any. Thanks, Greg. But, but it's a person who eats garlic. So what they do is they go upstairs and press, 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 you know, you know, they do the whole thing. They go there. And then what they do is they go downstairs. Now, let me ask you, do you smell the garlic? Okay, it's exactly the same thing. Because it stays with you. That's why you don't let it around you. One of the most difficult things that I have ever, ever had to undertake in my life was actually pastoring. It's probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. But let me tell you why. Because as a, as a Christian, in my Christian life, I would tell a person, shut your yapper. I don't want to hear what you have to say. You are not going to put your crappy seeds in my good garden. It's taken me every day to clean this thing out just from what my mother told me. <laughs> and you think I'm going to let you drop some seeds? I mean, there was very many things my mother called me that were an irony. Son of a... You know, just... Just stuff not thinking. But I'm your son. You know, I just, I don't get it. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, I thought that was my name until I was 13. I actually really did. I actually really did. I thought, hey. So here, here's, the, here's the thing, is that God has called you to dress and keep the garden. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23, David told Solomon, and he wrote it down, he said this, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of your life. You don't let that get in your garden. Keep it out of the garden. Well, well, yeah, but, but you want to be accepted. Just say it like that. And that way you can deal with yourself over the fact that you want to be accepted. You don't want. You want to be included. Everybody wants inclusion. Why do you think the baboons actually groom each other? So that they can keep strong emotional ties. But that's the reason why Jesus said this. My mother and my brothers. I remember that when I had to tell my parents that. Because, you know, there were a lot of things in life that I needed to overcome. How many of you had to overcome anything when you became a believer? You had stuff to overcome, didn't you? Well, yeah, but that was, that was true. I remember that finally my mom and my dad were attempting to do everything they could do to tie me to the history and the genealogy of my family. And really, I didn't get to come from a Christian home. I didn't have a church background. I didn't get to grow up in church. I didn't, you know, I don't care how bad your church was. I really don't care how bad your church was. No matter what, you were still better than growing up in a bar. I don't care how bad your church was. There are so many things you don't have to overcome. Because when you're seven years old, you have to start overcoming things that adults go through who don't survive. And you have to deal with them from a time that you're little. And you don't know how to do it. And so I remember the day that I told my parents, whom I loved tremendously and dearly, and I was grateful that Linda and I were able to take care of them until my mom passed just last January. 
And I remember the day that I had to tell him, I said, Mom, Dad, I said, I want to let you know that my mother and my brothers are those that hear the word of God and do it. One of the hardest things you have to say in your whole life. But if you don't, if you don't. Number four is address the gossiper. Address them. Address the gossiper. It's going to take a little bit of courage, but stand up to the lead gossiper and address them one-on-one -on -one and tell them, say, look, what you're saying is wrong. You might, have, you might think that you have a fact, but just because you're saying it is wrong, just because you're even bringing it up, it's wrong. Number five, Encourage positive gossip. If you want to gossip, gossip on the positive side, not on the negative side. Start saying good things about people. Start talking good words about them, not negative words. Whenever you see anybody in your group trying to bring up something negative about anybody, what you do, jump right in, man, and turn it over. You know, I really, I, I remember something that Kenneth Hagin said when they, when they actually said to him, they said, you know, you probably would never say anything even against the devil, would you? And he said, well, he is a persistent cuss, isn't he? <laughs> That's the worst thing you Kenneth Hagin could say about the devil. He's just persistent. He's my man. He stays after it. He sticks with it. And so encourage positive gossip. The, accident, the, the opposite of a negative culture is a positive culture that you create. Number six, you have to get to the place to where you ignore the gossiper. Because there are times when you just have to not pick up the phone. There are times when what you need to do is just text them back and say, you know what, I'm not even, I'm not even reading your texts anymore. You're just a negative person. I'm not going to do that. If you want to say what God says, I'll, I'll text you back. And we can talk about it. But I'm not going to get into this whole thing. I'm not going to try to answer this for you. I'm not going to try to defend this. You see, you can't defend gossip because it has a little bit of truth in it. And people are drawn to it. Number seven, turn it back on the gossiper with saying something positive. Just turn it around. Number eight, and this is lastly, keep private things private. You stay out of the private lives of other people. God never called you into the private life of another individual. He never did. Do you know the reason why that you can deal with depression or discouragement is most often that you're too far into a relationship than you need to be. It's too far. Amen. I'm done. Okay, that was gossip. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us understand the Word of God concerning such a subject that can steal the life out of your believers, out of your children. Father, help us. Help us to know what gossip is. Help us to know who the gossipers are. Help us, Father, to help others. May you use us, Holy Spirit, in the lives of other people. May you have your way with us tonight. Cause us to hear your loving kindness. Give us words of encouragement for every person. Every person that we know, that we see, that we talk about. Give us words. Words of life to be able to speak over people. May we choose inside of our lives to give up negative words forever. 
Even Moses told us that he set before us life and death and blessing and cursing. Choose blessing. So, Father, we choose blessing in this house tonight. Say this after me. Father, I choose to bless others. I choose to use my words to lift others up, to deliver them, and to set them free. Thank you, Father, that from this night forward, I'm asking you to give me something good to say about every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's true, isn't it? It's true, man. Glory to God. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. Thank God for the Word of God. Man, unless the Word had been our delight, we would have perished in our afflictions. May God help us. Amen. It's really true.